Yeah, so you know, diverticulitis, you say, well, there's something going on in the gut, right, the intestines. Um, there's tests to be done to configure out why that is. Now, diverticulitis, in some respects, is just inflammation within, on the walls of the intestines, and the inflammation creates sort of weak spots, and you start getting these, these, pou- these pouches, and then the diverticulosis is the pouches because of the weak spot in the wall, and then when they get inflamed, which is the itis, you get diverticulitis inflammation within these pouches. So you know you've got gut issues, mm-hmm. and um, a big... Uh, problem when you get gut issues to start with, kind of long before the diverticulosis lightest part, uh, it usually takes years or decades to actually be bad enough where somebody goes, oh, you got this disease. So the inflammation that was the precursor for the diverticulosis and diverticulitis will create what they call an intestinal permeability disorder, where you actually get leakiness between the cells of the intestine and then things that are in the gut that should not be in the gut things in the gut that should never get into the bloodstream get into the bloodstream. They should go in the toilet. They get in the bloodstream and really create problems in the body, including it creates food sensitivities. And there's ways that food bug, foods bug people, kind of two main ways. One's kind of immediate and the other is delayed hypersensitivity reactions. So the immediate hypersensitivity reactions to foods are I eat this food and every time I do, I feel crummy enough, quick enough that I know this food's bugging me. And actually people are better at figuring that out than any test we have. The real sneaky part though is people can also develop these delayed hypersensitivity reactions to food. This is when you eat a food and days later or maybe even three to four weeks later, you get some inflammation produced. Now, if you don't know the food's bugging it because it's not bugging you right away, people keep eating it, and that inflammation just grows, grows, grows until you go, holy cow, I got inflammation all over my body, kind of like the, the, this, this uh, viewer was asking. It's inflammation everywhere, not just the intestine. And so when it comes to autoimmune disease, we know that every person with an autoimmune disease, no matter what kind you got, Everybody's got problems with the proteins in wheat. There's actually 62 different proteins in wheat that bug people in this situation. Gluten is just one of them. And you have a problem with sensitivity to the proteins within cow's milk dairy products. Butter tends to be okay because it's a really good fat, but it's all fat that's not really the proteins. So anybody with an autoimmune issue, you know they got a wheat gluten issue, cow's milk dairy. That being said, you can get a whole bunch of other foods bugging you over time. And there's testing that can be done to identify what foods those are. You get rid of them temporarily. You can then fix the gut because you don't have foods bugging the gut anymore. You can fix all the gut symptoms. But because the gut's the central mechanism, you're going to be fixing that systemic inflammation that's all over the place, which tends to develop in multiple organ systems once the gut gets disrupted enough. So you can actually reset these sensitivities because by fixing the gut, you're going to be fixing the reason why these sensitivities happen in the first place. And even with autoimmune disease, you can get rid of pretty much almost all of these sensitivities over time. The one you're kind of locked into with autoimmune disease is the wheat and gluten. But if you don't have an autoimmune disease, you just have chronic disease not associated with autoimmune disease. You could even reset the wheat part along with all the other foods. 